Thank you, Alice. Okay, and I've got uh, three more slides to wrap this up. Ed? Three or four. Okay, Korea 1953 to 2013. Uh, many of you might have participated in some of the deployments to Korea. Team Spirit, Ultra Focus Lens, RSOI are three of the major exercises that have occurred there over the years. And all of these support Operation Plan 5027, which is the defense of the Korean Peninsula. And you recognize some of the symbols here? 3MF, stationed in Okinawa, of course, to support the 5027. U.S. Forces Korea, and I put the Marine Corps uh, emblem there. The seal, Marine Corps seal. Next slide. Let's peel back those units a little bit more. Who really um, are the combatant forces that defend the Korean Peninsula today? Well, all 150 miles of the DMZ are guarded by ROC, ROC Marine and ROC Army, ROC Republic of Korea, Korean Marines and Korean Army. In fact, specifically, the Korean Marines have the islands out on the Han River, the second Korean Marine Division. And here's the fighting units that maintain, uh, in that, that support the 5027. Does anybody recognize this symbol? Eighth U.S. Army, nice job. <clears throat> right here, you get this one then. Second, in, sec, second Infantry Division, Indian Head. Their division headquarters has been in Korea for uh, decades. Okay, how about this one? Anybody serve with this unit? Third Marine Division, you betcha. How about this one? What's its link to the Marine Corps? Next slide. Can you place this picture in history? That's my tie to that rock Marine symbol. And this is my last slide. Ed Doyne took this. This is the Rock Marine Liaison to 1st Marine Division in Vietnam in 1969 as a symbol of the Korean, Korean Liaison and link with the U.S. Marine Corps. Okay, next slide. That concludes my presentation. And the floor is now open for comments, questions, any sea stories. And I want to emphasize that Frank Alban took the time to mail this to me express. And so uh, put, if you just pass some of these around to various tables, make sure this gets out on behalf of Frank. That's all I've got. Hoorah. Well, good afternoon. Uh, they, they say I was in Korea, yes. I was there so long that when I used to go back to my foxhole, I said I'm going home. <laughs> I was there more than a year. One, the one thing about the Incheon landing, uh, yes, but we made it and about three days later though, the 5th Marines were on the left and the 1st Marines on the right in a little town on the way to Yongdong-po. And here comes 100 exactly North Korean soldiers marching down the road, laughing and having a good time with six T-34 tanks. They think we're back on the beach. They're going to go clean up a few Marines. Well, all of a sudden, we opened up on them. We killed 96 North Korean soldiers almost instantly and destroyed all six tanks and killed every crew member. Now then, the, the part of the story here is that who comes along but two or three jeeps? And first one out of the jeep is General MacArthur. He says, boy, you guys did a good job. He's looking at all the carnage. And with him is uh, two couple admirals from the Navy, the commandant of the Marine, I mean the uh, Commandant, yes, of the 1st Marine Division. And all of his word was, he said, you guys have the better, the best way of advertising I've ever seen. He did tell my platoon, he says, why don't you guys move up a little bit further to my company, Commander? Well, well we did. We moved up then to the OB beer, beer factory. And we kind of dug in there for a few minutes at Yong Dong Po. The thing is, we got some 76 millimeter artillery fire. And I started digging a foxhole because I didn't know if we were going to be there long. Well, all of a sudden, I said the artillery stopped. So I sat on the edge of my foxhole. But along comes one more 76 shell. Lands exactly two feet from me. And doesn't go off. And I could reach out to the hole in the ground. And the guys came over and said, you're the luckiest guy here. We're going to stay with you. 
So then, yes, what you stole, there was a block-to-block -block thing. It was, if we burned, the Jesse Puller said, I'm not going to, to uh, sacrifice one Marine to keep this city clean. So any time the North Korean shot at us, he called up a flame-throwing tank, and we burned down the building. So it was too weak, block-to-block, -block, burning, burning. But anyway, then it was out of the town and back up to the north. And everybody landed at one sun, and after the regiment went, started up towards the reservoir. But my group, a couple, three of our uh, of our companies, Chesty Puller said, "You go, you go south to Kojo because one of our battalions there was partially overrun." And we went, I was in a train, we went down there and I got there at midnight. And the train was Constantina Wire rolls. And I, for 40 miles, I stood in one of those rolls. I deserved about 15 Purple Arts. <laughs> got there at midnight and Corsairs were bombing the railroad track ahead of us. And then with one of the Marines with the group that was overrun, I asked, where's the front line? He says, the railroad track. He says, oh, you better get off on this side. Well, I, I did get uh, injured there. Well, then we were able to escape that, and I wound up in a uh, MASH hospital, the 618th Army Field Hospital, for about 10 days. I left there when a North Korean soldier from the uh, 10th Division came in and threw a hand grenade in. And I said, Dale, it's time for me to go back to my unit. It's safer. But those army medics were treated us wonderfully. The thing that was so nice is on the way out, they said, go to our commissary here. Maybe you could use some cold, some clothes, it's cold. So I went in, he says, you want a pile cap? I said, sure. You want a pile coat? I said, sure. You want some old pants? I said, sure. How about a wool jacket? I said, sure. And then I put my arm, I put them all on. And then I put my Marine Corps for the utilities over them so nobody would know who I was. But anyway, they said, well, it's too late for you to go up to Chosen Reservoir. I want you to go guard the regimental tent. So who was it at Chesty Polder's tent? And he said, he came out, he says, I want you two guys to walk around my tent all night and guard it. Well, he never went to bed, I don't think. Every hour, he came out to see if we were asleep. <laughs> the next day, I got in a truck and headed up to the reservoir. And yeah, and you all, all know about it, so I won't bother with the details. But, but I did march out one all night. All one night. It took all. It took all night to walk out and get out of there. And I remember some of the guys on the ground who were just going to stay there. And I had to kick him and collar at him, cuss at him, and kick him and say, Get up, we're moving. And then he got to board the ship and got back down to what we call the bean patch. Well, it so, it so happened I hadn't had any food for about two or three days. And we were in my buddy and my Broman, the machine gunner. We heard that the 5th Marines were serving pancakes. So we walked over to the 5th Marines and got in the back of the line. And when we got to almost to the pancakes, a great big Marine looked like a bulldog out of a poster. He says, you two jerks aren't in the 5th Marines. Get the hell out of here. So what we did, we went around the back and stole two cases of ten and ones. <laughs> and we brought them back, and I started, I started opening up the cans and fixing everything. I told the squad, the other, the, 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 uh, the unit, to go ahead and start gathering firewood and whatever. And then I said, okay, we're just ready to start the fire and cook. But I saw somebody walking over on my left. My, my right side, rather. And I looked up, and who was it but Chesty Puller? And he says, well, Sergeant, I see, even though we haven't issued any food, 
you've taken care of your men. I said, yes, sir. Come join us. He says, no, I have food on my own, but I don't have any firewood. I said, would you like some of ours? He put his two hands out, arms out. He never quit until he picked the last piece we had. <laughs> He's, he said, thank you, and walked away. Now then, it's Christmas Eve. He gets up on a soapbox and starts talking about the big battle we had up north. And we're going to go back and push those guys all the way back up to the Yellow River. What difference does it make whether you live to be 25 or 105? You got to die sometime. At that point, there was a corporal with us who had been 17 years. You don't get that much anymore, but he took a hand grenade and threw it in the slit trench. And paper and stuff flew all over and pepped in. Colonel Puller said, that's the end of my speech. <laughs> the next day, we had a 17-year private. <laughs> well, after that, I guess I was a slow learner. They kept me there for one more year. What did I do? I was a section leader in an 81 millimeter mortar company. I'll get back to that in a moment. And then dog company had so many casualties. And I was experienced. I'd been in since 47. That they, they transferred me and I became a squad leader in dog company. Second battalion, first marines. I was there for a year and then they brought some replacements, a lot of them. They sent me back to weapons company again. And then I became a sniper. That's because I'd been on a rifle team back in the States. And our two snipers had gotten wounded and gone. They were in the company, so I had a 1903 Springfield with a 10 power unital scope and a 20 power sit down scope. Not like today's sniper, it was different. The lieutenant said, there's a sector. Anybody in that sector is the enemy, shoot them and kill them. Well, I didn't have to fire much, but on the right side was the Korean Marines. And I, I watched them with the 20 power scope. As they worked to, to fight against the North Koreans that were still there. They were very brave. It took three days to take a position. And then I watched the North Koreans counterattack and kill a whole bunch of them. I just... I decided to quit watching, that was enough. I didn't want to see that anymore. So then, uh, that was basically, that was the old 749 where Frank Album got wounded on our left. As I mentioned, that was the third highest casualty rate in the Korean War for the, Korean, for the Marine Corps. And then after 13 plus months, there were only about five or six of us left. I got lucky, though, in a, in a mortar platoon. We only had 85% casualties during the time I was there. In dog company, it, it ran over 100%, as you would imagine. So anyway, I, I managed to get through it all and get home. And then I became a weapons instructor at Camp Pendleton. I got out and spent 33, 33 years with BAT, a British company. One little story, chosen few group, group, we went to London, England, and I said, well, let's go up and see the president the, of the cup company I just retired from because I do the president we live on Mercer Island my wife and I so anyway we go up to the top and I go up to see the secretary the president of the worldwide company and I gave her my name she says oh he's not here I said oh I said where is he well he's over in the in the states I said, oh, really? Where's he at? And she said, yes, he's 
over in the States on Mercer Island. That's right. I said, where is he? She said, some place called Mercer Island. <laughs> I said, why? She said, we just bought Farmer's Insurance Company. You want to see what it was? <laughs> so after 33 years, I wound up here in Seattle still, and I joined every Marine Corps group around. And it's been great. Thank you. Great story. It's a, it's a shame that we don't have time sometimes to do more of those stories. There are an awful lot of them in the room. Alice, I want to tell you, that was a great presentation. The 20,000 women Marines that were brought in to the Marine Corps in World War II, you need to understand that first off, the Commandant was opposed to bringing women into the Marine Corps. He was badgered into it because the other services had women in their services. So he brought them in, and after nine months, he said, we don't need fancy names. They're Marines. 20,000. That represented the ability to field the 6th Marine Division. That's how important it was to free a Marine to fight. Another story about Korea. Down in the Pusan Reservoir, the 4th Marines were down there, and they were kind of a bucket brigade. The North Koreans would hit the, the front lines and the Army General would move the battalion around over to where they were and the North Koreans had to fight the Marines and they'd lose. And the, Marine, the North Koreans would attack another point in the line and they moved the Marines over there and the North Koreans would lose. I tell you that story because the North Koreans published a document to all of their units. Do not fight people with yellow legs, because we had leggings back in those days. And so the yellow legs, that's bad news. Forget it. That's a Korean story that uh, goes back a long way. In fact, it played a very important role in uh, keeping South Korea free. I promised Steve a two-minute shot here from the aviation side, so you're on. I'll give another restricted aviator an opportunity to say something. Well, uh, thanks, Jim, for uh, giving me this great slot right behind Mike's uh, awesome story. Thank you. I <laughs> uh, just want to re remind everyone, uh, we certainly didn't expect when we first started doing the fundraiser for the Injured Marine Semper Fi Fund that we'd be doing it this long. However, we're uh, de uh, committed to doing it again this year. Uh, I've got some envelopes with me I'd like to be able to uh, present to anybody who's interested. Uh, this is our eighth year coming up to uh, do the fundraiser. For the last four years, four years ago we raised, we netted 23,500 bucks. Three years ago, 26,000. Two years ago, 33,000. Last year, 40,000. So we're on, a, we're on a roll in a crappy economy. And I'd like to personally thank everyone who has uh, provided a donation to us for the last, in some cases, seven years. There are some folks in here that have done that. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of other uh, Korean vets that uh, I don't know if they belong to the support group, but I know at least one of them belongs to the uh, chosen few, and that's Boyce Clark and Richard Laird. In addition to Mike Cavanaugh and Fred Lillian and Boyce and uh, Richard, thank you all four of you guys for donating every year. We've had this if the Korean vets can do it. Everybody else certainly can. The three wives who started this down at Camp Pendleton have raised 65 million bucks, given out 45,000 grants to families, 94 cents on the dollar. Okay, is there anything else for the good of the order? Remember our meeting on the 16th of March. Thank you very much. We are adjourned.